the Detroit Tigers sweep the Chicago White Sox in Chicago this weekend. Not, I don't even like calling it spoilers. The White Sox were kind of always on the outside looking in. It was going to be a long shot, but they still, little spoilers, little spoilers. Today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, September 26th, 2022. Thank you for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Okay, so as we said in the cold open, the Detroit Tigers sweep the Chicago White Sox in Chicago. Really, some good baseball being played, some good ball being played. Offense. Maybe the most cohesive offensive unit we've seen all season, just in the sense of like it wasn't some staggered kind of throughout the lineup. Oh, these three did really well. These three sucked. The bottom of the lineup didn't do anything, but the top of the lineup guy, you know, scored six runs on their own. Like this really was all three games, like top to bottom, just looked really solid. Everybody from one through nine was productive and, and, going deep into counts and all that. And we, they haven't done this all year. And it's just like, not necessarily where has this been? Cause I, it's one series at the end of the day, but like, where has this been? <laughs> like, golly, man. Like I, it, it's, it's a little frustrating to be honest with you, to watch them go out this weekend. And like I said, it was, it was so cohesive. There was so much good, game planning, going deep into counts. Everybody knew what to look for. Everybody was spitting on tough pitches. A, a lot of leadoff hitters getting on base, like almost every single inning, it seemed like. A lot of drawn walks, uh, really good situational hitting. Some power showed up. Like it, it, all around, just a solid offensive showing. And we get a sweep against a team that is objectively better than us. We'll talk about the AL Central and such. At the end of the show, I think that's going to be our third and final segment, but just like, it's nice to see that it's possible, but what we have a week and a half left in the season. I think the season ends a week from Wednesday would have been nice to see some sort of life a little bit earlier. I guess Spencer Dorgelson made a comment where he said, you know, the mindset in the clubhouse is if we're not making the playoffs, neither are you and, and such. And that's awesome. And you want to be competitive like that. You want that competitive edge. My thing is just like, and you know, the Tigers Twitter account was like, oh, we're playing spoilers. It's spoiler season. And that's what everybody's mindset is. And the White Sox certainly had a chance to make the postseason before this series, but it's not like like it was always kind of an outside chance. I don't want to be like Debbie Downer either, but it was always kind of a, a, an outsider's chance. I don't know if it was a true spoilers situation. I, I mean, they were behind Baltimore going into the weekend, and Baltimore after the weekend is still four games back. The, the White Sox were uh, from the third wild card. The White Sox were already uh, what uh, uh, on an L three. Had already lost three in a row going into the weekend, and now have obviously lost six in a row. I don't know. Like it, it certainly, it certainly is fun and everything. But even if they had swept us, like I'm, I don't know, I don't know. Spoiler is a little bit of a loose term, I think. I'm not sure the White Sox were were really like in the in the thick of a a really good playoff hunt, and we completely ruined their and derailed their entire playoff chase and whatnot. Like they had already gotten swept heading into us, and. And, and we kind of just like put the nail in the coffin, right? Like we definitely did a, a little bit. We, we, we finished them off for sure, but I don't know. I, I don't know if it was a true, it didn't feel like a true, wow, we really caused some disruption in the rankings. Like, no, the team with the lowest odds that was still in the playoff picture is now just like still has the lowest odds. They're just lower than they were before. That's all. Um, but regardless, good ball being played offensively. Like I said, let's talk about, 
some of the standouts, I mean, it really was a really solid team performance all around, which is great to see. I thought Kerry Carpenter had a pretty solid weekend. I don't, he didn't look great. I didn't think on Friday, but on Sunday, I, I thought he looked a lot better, especially like there, there was, there's some strides being taken there and he continues to make adjustments and looks really good. And we talked about on Friday's show, kind of looking ahead and seeing who on the team now is, is going to be in the picture next season on opening day and and he continues to play himself into that conversation i i can't say with the utmost confidence that he's gonna be like an everyday starter i actually don't I, i'm not sure that is the game plan I, I don't think he really will be but he, he's certainly playing his way on to to being on this maybe maybe he's the fourth out for their next year maybe he's on the team as you know if, if miggy's taking a serious step back and at bats i mean i, I don't know but He's certainly making it really hard to look at next year and not go, oh, we should probably circle Kerry Carpenter's name and have him on the team. So continue to be really impressed by him. Uh, Torkelson, the big talk of the town really ever since he got came, ever since he came back up from the minors, rather. I, I think that his at-bats look considerably better than they did before he got sent down. I continue to think that even I think he only had one hit, one or two hits this weekend. Not the most production ever, but he, he the biggest thing with him is just the first step in development. Just hit what the pitcher gives you. Take advantage of mistakes. When they throw a pitch right down the middle, when they throw a pitch in, in the center ninth of the strike zone, drive it. And, and that's something that his first stint in the majors, he wasn't even able to do, right? So that's really the biggest thing for me with him is just, I, w he'll, he'll continue to develop and take strides. And, and I, I think that we're, we're heading in a good direction, especially since he got called back up and, and, and all that. But the biggest thing I want to see just for the last, whatever, week and a half of the season is just please, for the love of everything, just hit balls right down the middle. We'll worry about expanding that zone and becoming more dangerous all over the strike zone next season. Just let's start with the basics of hitting balls right down the middle. And I thought this weekend, still some work to be done, but uh, continues to put good swings on balls that are that are hittable. So that's at least some steps in the right direction. Jonathan Scope had a really good weekend. I don't think that really changes anything. I don't think that like salvages a job. It might be a little too little too late as far as he goes, but nice to see at, at, at least and really helped us in a couple of at-bats or a couple of games, rather a couple of at-bats, a couple of games. Uh, Riley Green, I thought had a really solid weekend. He, he just works. He's working the count really well lately being that patiently aggressive hitter that we really want to see him turn into. Uh, I thought he had a really effective weekend. Really effective. Miguel Cabrera with a hit. <clears throat> with a hit. Uh, Eric Haas effective this weekend. I mean, everybody really top to bottom. But the biggest offensive story from the week, I think that's everybody else I wanted to, to talk about. Kreider had a hit. That's nice to see at least. Um, but uh, again, I think he's kind of in the same boat as some of these other guys where he, he's going to have to really like go crazy in the last week of a half. Week and a week and a half. Goodness of a season. To uh to you know pencil him as him as an everyday starter or something which he won't be next year so we'll see it's gonna be a really fun off season I really I, I I don't wish baseball games away especially not Tigers baseball I I'm gonna take in every every game we have left even if it is this product but um, I'm really pumped to see what Scott Harris and and Co are going to do with this team this off season the big story offensively though this weekend was Javi Baez he just he can't help himself and he just turns into prime Barry bonds when he goes to Chicago. I, I don't, I, and I know Sunday, I think he went over over five, maybe on Sunday. Um, but the tiger still won Friday and Saturday. He, he looked incredible. He looked absolutely incredible at the plate. And it's, you know, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't like, he, he just loves being the center of attention. He loves being like the, the man in the arena feeling right. Like, in that moment, and you could tell he thrives in that. And in a season when you have like one of the worst offenses ever, which you were a part of, uh, you're one of the reasons it was. It's hard to find those moments where you can really be like the the big man uh, on the team and be the big payroll guy and and really 
come through in a clutch moment when there aren't very clutch moments to pass around this season. I will say this. he ha- His numbers are considerably better since the All-Star break, and they are considerably better in the last few weeks. And I continue to be a little bit more impressed. And the defense, the throwing is horrific. We can all agree on that, but the range is still there. Maybe you move him to second, whatnot, or you just teach him how to throw a ball to first base from short. My point is there's still value there, and I, I, I have always thought this. I thought this when we signed him. Javi Baez can make a, a, a big impact on a game. We've seen it this year. As much as nobody wants to admit it, there have, especially early in the season, there were games where like if you remember the slow start we got off to offensively when Javi was making like three diving catches and going like three for five with a home run, two RBIs, and like we'd win two to one, right? Like he 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 has that like takeover game ability, but I I genuinely think he would be a a lot more well liked throughout the fan base because this season has objectively been a disaster for him. But also, I just think he would be. I guess maybe that's it. Just looked at a lot more fondly and a lot more accepted. Like his flaws would be accepted a lot more if he was like the fourth, fifth, sixth best player on a team. And I know we are leaps and bounds. We are miles away from a point where Javi Baez is the fourth, fifth, sixth best player on this baseball team. We we have a lot of work to do with roster construction. But I think that you accept the player he is a lot more when he is not the best player on your team. He is not at a point, production-wise, clearly, where he can be the best player on a team and that team can be really effective and be dangerous and be a dangerous contender. But I do still think that there's good baseball left. I think that he's proven in the last couple of months that he can be that productive player. His war is is steady climbing. It's going to end the season at a at a... Not the number we were expecting, but a lot more respectable of a number that it looked like he was going to hit the all-star break. I think that there is some production we can salvage, and I think there is a role for him on this team when we are competitive again. It's just not the two-hitter on uh, on a team. He, he should not be the two- or three-hitter on a really good team in 2022. But I, I still think that that he has a role and, and that he can find that, and if you look at the best teams and how much the best players get paid, he's not getting paid quite like the best players on the best teams in the league. So I, I think we can still carve out a role for him. Now, we'll, we'll see what the offseason holds. I'm not saying that there, there's not moves to be made and stuff. We'll see what the offseason holds. But I, I just want to get that out there. I, I do think, and this weekend kind of highlights it, as long as he is not the main producer and doesn't have to put the team on his back every single night, he has a he has a role on a on a good baseball team. That's all. Okay, let's get to the pitching side of things. But first, I have to tell y'all about our friends over at LinkedIn Talent Solutions. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be one hundred percent certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. So you go to the website, add your job, the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile and spread the word that you are hiring. Simple tools like screening questioning make it easier to focus on candidates with the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you would like to hire. That's why small business rates LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, everybody. Welcome back here. Segment two of locked on tigers went a little long there in segment one, but I really, uh, I really do feel like there is a, a role where people aren't going to be unbelievably frustrated and think of him as like the worst player they've ever seen in their lives uh, on this team going forward. It's just not as the the <laughs> the best player 
on said team. So we'll see what direction we had this off season, but I think it, it, I can't wait. I really can't wait. The off season is going to be a lot of fun. Pitching side of things, I, I really, I, we'll talk about Erod, but outside of that, I, I mean, like Drew Hutchinson started this weekend on Saturday, right? Five innings, four hits, two earned runs, two walks, one K. I, uh, you know, you're ever in a, a, you're always in a Drew Hutchinson start, so that that's good. But uh, you know, he is what he is. He's got a four and a half ERA on the year. You're always going to be in it, but uh, he's never going to be a, a guy you lean on and go, okay, you know, it's Drew Hutchison day. Like we're going to dominate. You know what I mean? It's always, it's what he has been. It's what he will be. I'm really intrigued on what's going to happen with him this off season as well. I think he's currently at a role where he, he has played himself into at least getting a minor league contract depth piece somewhere. If not, here again like we did last year where we let him go and then brought him back that 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 might be what we do again because I mean there's a lot of teams out there that could use the pitching depth that he provides he, he is very effective in that area and very good at that role so big tip of the cap to him uh not too much analysis though I mean like the the slider was, was working well and uh that's what got him kind of over the the not finish line but over the hump and, and was able to get him to to limp his way kind of through the fifth inning and and be on the winning side of a baseball game. So good for him. The bullpen, this entire series, I thought was pretty effective. And we'll t again, we'll talk about the White Sox and the division as a whole at the very end because the Guardians also officially clinched the AL Central. I just want to kind of give my overall thoughts on the division uh, at the end of the show here. But uh, yeah, I really think that the bullpen had a really solid weekend. Alex Lang has been in absolute fuego and he started off really hot. And then in the middle of the season, cooled down. And then in August was pretty terrible. And then in September now, ha especially the last like two weeks has just been unbelievable. Uh, went on a like no hit streak there for however many innings, seven, eight, nine innings. I mean, he, he really has been insanely effective. Uh, and uh, I continue to be really excited about the future of Alex Lang and what he can provide for this bullpen. If he can, I said it a million times, but he doesn't even need to be like Maddox with command. He doesn't even need to be pinpoint. He just needs to get the ball. Like if you were to draw a circle in the strike zone and just throw it there and you're like, hey, hit somewhere in this region, it's going to be a swing and a miss. If he can even get to that, he's going to be very, very effective in this league out of the bullpen for a long time. Jose Cisnero, I thought, you know, roller coaster, I, a couple of walks, a couple of strikeouts, it seems like every time we see him, that's kind of what it looks like. He really does not frustrate me, but it's just there's something missing. It's not the Jose Cisnero of 2020 and 2021, even though the ERA is really low. And I, it's not a very big sample size and whatnot, but he's giving up a lot of base runners. He's just able to squeak his way out of it. He, he's always kind of been a ground ball-ish pitcher. So, like, that's that's definitely – part of the allowing base runners but not runs thing maybe but there's a lot of walks there's a lot of walks and the the slider I thought was really good on Saturday which I haven't really said about a Jose Cisnero appearance in a while there, there's still the pieces are all there and he's another one I've circled I'm very intrigued on what direction the front office is going to head with him Andrew Chafin kind of a, a back on the horse weekend I thought he was pretty effective uh Gregory Soto really solid weekend and and he is probably the biggest in this bullpen, and not even probably, he's, he's probably easily in this bullpen, the biggest question mark going into the offseason. And I think everybody wants to point at, you know, Scott Harris's philosophy and go, oh, he's all about pounding the strike zone and dominating the strike zone, and Gregory Soto doesn't do that. We talked about it on Friday, so I won't re-go down that, that whole rabbit hole. But, um, yeah. There's a lot of questions to be answered with him, so that that's another guy. I I, I re I'm so pumped for for this off season just to see. There's so infinite possibilities with with like almost all of these dudes, and I'm really intrigued on what's going to happen. Um, but yeah, as a whole, just really solid bullpen weekend. Um, as far as the other starters, Tyler Alexander, I thought he was pretty solid on Sunday. That's back to back outings for him that he has looked really really good. You know, the biggest thing for him, six innings, four hits, one earned run, one walk, five Ks. The biggest thing for him, uh, it, for the most part, just comes down to fastball command because all similar to Erod, and we'll talk about him last, but 
all of his other pitches are movement wise and tunneling wise build off of the four seam fastball. So when that thing has decent command, he can really hone in and give you some pretty productive outings. Oh my goodness. My nose is itching again. I don't know why this happens like once a week uh, on this show, but it does. Um, so all of his pitches are, are based off of how effective the four seam fastball is. The cutter moves one way, the changeup moves one way, right? That's just how it is. And, and like I said, Erod's the same way. So in this one, I thought his fastball command was really solid. And he took advantage of a White Sox team that has really struggled offensively too, much like us. So shout out Tyler Alexander. Lastly, we'll do Ed. We'll do Erod. Um, this was a, a very Erod outing. This was a very Erod outing. He goes six innings, eight hits, three earned runs, one walk, and three strikeouts. No swing and miss stuff. Five whiffs total. And that's going to be something next season we're going to need. And he has the ability to. And we've seen it before. And at the end of the day, however, he has always been and will continue to be a pitch-to-contact guy. If you expected us, we, we you know gave this money to add and – he should come in and, and Eduardo Rodriguez should be this guy that's getting 10 K's a game. That's never going to be Eduardo Rodriguez. That's not who he is. That's not who he's ever been. If you, if you ever looked at him in Boston or whatnot, that that's literally never the type of pitcher he was. He was always a pitch to contact. I don't pitch to contact. Doesn't even really do it justice, but um, he, he definitely induced a lot of ground balls and, and a lot of weak contact. And that's what has made him so effective is because at, at one point he really mastered the art of it. And that with that being said, five whiffs on an outing, we need that number up there. there you can be still a, a guy that is really good at inducing weak contact. And that's your go-to while also at least being able to have some pitches that you can go, okay, I need a swing and a miss here. I'm going to throw this and get that. You need a strike pitch. You need a, a not guaranteed because nothing is guaranteed, but you need a, a pitch that you can go to in your repertoire and be like, okay, this is the, what I'm going to, this is going to be a strike or, or a, or a setup that you go to and you consistently go, okay, I really need, a swing and a miss here. I need some efficiency. I'm going to go fastball up and in and, and cut her low and away or whatever. Like you, you need something in your bag to, to be able to get some swings and misses. And he has certainly lacked that this season. Really weird year for him. Uh, I'm, I don't even know how much I'm really going to take performance wise out of this season. I, like he, he certainly hasn't been as good as what we wanted him to be, but at the same time with, with as ridiculous as a season as he has had with, with all the off the field stuff and, and just dropping off the face of the planet for a little bit. I, I don't even know how much I'm supposed to take out of it. It's a really weird year and a really hard year to analyze a lot of these players. And he is certainly maybe the poster child for that him and Austin Meadows. So, uh, but that being said, did induce a lot of weak contact, had eight hits, but only gave up three in runs. A lot of BABIP stuff, to be honest with you. A lot of weak contact that found its way through. Got hit hard a couple of times, admittedly, for sure. It's just, that's just the Eduardo Rodriguez experience. And uh, we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens with him going forward and, and whatnot and how the organization plans on using him. Uh, but he was never brought in to be the ace of this team, uh, like a competitive Tigers team. And uh, you, you should never think uh, solid two or three, I, I think. You know, ceiling is a two, more likely probably a really good three for a for a deep playoff contender at his best. And we, he's not playing like that. He's not pitching like that, certainly. he's not. He hasn't been that good even. Um, so next year is, is, a, is a big year for Eduardo Rodriguez. He really needs to come out and, and re-show people why we went out and, and got him and brought him in and why people like myself were so excited to get him because there's a lot to like. We just haven't seen any of those reasons to, to like so far. So uh, that's it for the pitching. Uh, I just want to do a quick, not too long, just a quick couple of minute rundown on, uh, on the AL Central now that it is officially the Cleveland Guardians for the first time in a few years. And we'll talk about that right after this. Welcome back, everybody. Third and final segment of Locked On Tigers. Okay, so AL Central this weekend on Sunday, I believe. 
the uh, the Cleveland Guardians officially clinched the AL Central first time since what 2018, right? White Sox last year, the Twins the two years before that, 2020 and 2019. So I think that's I think that's right. So here's the thing about Cleveland. They're always going to be competitive. And I've always tried to relay that message to people. I've always believed that. And they surpassed my expectations this year. I don't I think most people expected the White Sox to just show up and win the division again. I think that was a a pretty shared opinion and and shared honestly assumption by, by most because they ran away with it last year. And the NBC Chicago tweeted us wondering if the rest of the division is going to show up this year and then now are not going to make the playoffs. That makes me a little happy, but um it, it was at the same time, right? At the same time of, okay, I definitely, I was wrong. Well, I expected the White Sox to win the division. They didn't. That being said, I always tried to tell people like, look, the, the Cleveland Guardians are a pitching factory. And if their offense is anything outside of J-Ram, they're going to be legitimate and they're going to be a, a team that can compete. And I've said that year after year after year. That has been a belief that that I've always had about this team. In a lot of years, lately especially, they haven't had much of an offense outside of J-Ram. So it hasn't really mattered. This year, they did. They got incredible production from a lot of kids, a, a lot of prospects. Went out and made some under-the-radar signings. They put together a team. It's not an offensive powerhouse by any stretch. But they went and put together a team that is... The best player on the offense is one of the best players in the game of baseball, and everyone else around him is a really solid support player. We want to talk. We looked at we talked about last week with the Detroit Tigers, and and I went on that little rant where I was like, I am just begging for some even two win players. Right, you surround, and I'm not saying that they're all. Too, they had Jimenez had a unbelievable season like they 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 have they have talent I'm, I'm not i really like nolan jones going forward like they they have undeniable talent i'm not trying to say that this is just j ram and and a, a bunch of two win players but two win players are very valuable one and a half to two and a half win players are, are very valuable in this league and are very important support players and the cleveland guardians made a team that again Best, one of the best players in, in the American League, one of the best players in baseball, one of the most underrated players in all of baseball, is the focal point. And everyone else that's falling around that is a great support system. And, and you look down that lineup, they're getting a lot of production out of a lot of players that weren't expected to get production. And they don't spend a lot of money, and anybody, everybody clowns on them for that. Well, J-Ram's going to be there for a while. They did pay up for him. And outside of that, if they continue this, this just – borderline dominance of development they're going to be in this picture and i'm not saying they're going to win the division outright for the next whatever like five years but the cleveland guardians are going to have a win total in like the mid 80s for the foreseeable future because they have a pitching factory and, and they had this is this is not you knew they've had this for five six years now a a just developmentally a pitching factory over there and it's so impressive and i envy it so much and they they are so good they have a profile they go out and, and draft players that fit the profile they acquire players that put fit the profile and they tweak at the, the same thing in all these players that they bring in and they end up being unbelievable and, and end up end up pitching very valuable innings for cleveland going forward and i, I don't see that stopping anytime soon they have the top end pitching talent. Tristan McKenzie had a great year. Shane Bieber is still really good, and no one talks about it. That they 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 have it across the board. And I don't know how far they're going to go in the postseason, but Cleveland, I think, is a really good team. If you want to look at just the right way an organization should be ran, they don't even spend that much money, and yet they are going to have, be an over five hundred team that's in the divisional race. In late in September, year in and year out. And they're going to continue doing that. 
And just imagine if the Tigers could get to that point where you have crazy good development, are making all these good decisions, and players are improving even after they make the major leagues and not just improving throughout the pipeline and then hitting kind of a wall once they get to the majors. And you, you have this great development and this great scouting department are bringing in talent even without great draft picks every year, right? Like Cleveland it, you know, is not, hasn't been a 100-loss team in a while. They're not tanking to get all these players that you see now. And yet here they are. And if the Tigers can get there and we have an ownership group that has the ability to at least spend more money than a lot of these teams that make it work with low budgets, just imagine. Just close your eyes and imagine the possibilities. So I, I really like Cleveland. I really like the, the ship they run over there. The White Sox, uh, j- I mean, just a horrifically disappointing season catastrophic uh, outside of the Detroit Tigers. I think the only other two teams that really have an argument for more disappointing or bigger letdown of a season are the Chicago White Sox and the San Francisco Giants. I think that's it. And the Giants, to be completely honest, you could kind of see coming. I, I don't want to like to my homer and be like, how could you not have seen it? I, I didn't expect them to drop off by whatever, like 30 wins or whatnot, but um, I mean, if you looked at that roster last year and you expected the Giants to win 107 games again this year, I don't know what to tell you. Like that, that's kind of your own fault. Like they they got another year older, they lost Posey, etc. Like they this was kind of you could kind of see the writing on the wall with it that they were at least not gonna be what they were last year. The White Sox is just a catastrophic failure. And in a division that, again, before opening day, I think everybody looked around and went, there's really no one that should be even close to you. You should comfortably win the division. It shouldn't even be too much of a competition. And was never in the driver's seat, right? Like Cleveland has really taken it over in the second half of the season and and been, uh, like I said, a really good second half and and kind of taken the, the reins there. But the Twins... In the first half of the season, where the team that was like, oh my goodness, it's the Twins, and everybody kept asking me, and and I like the Twins, and and well, I don't really like the Twins. They're they're still a, a division rival, but in comparison to the other teams in our division, I don't dislike the Twins as much as Cleveland or Kansas City, or, or the White Sox, really. Um, but it's just it's because they're just like the Twins, and that's what. And, and some like Twins fans got mad at me or whatever. I you're going to have to prove me wrong. Like, I'm sorry. It's just until you prove me wrong, it's just like, Oh, like you're the twins. I don't know. Like you're, you're just like, you're, you're cute. It's like, you're the twins. I, I don't know. So they got a lot of questions to answer too. just talking about the twins. Uh, that's a team that the Buxton is one of the most talented baseball players I've ever seen. He's going to have to figure out how to play a, a remotely full season. They need to really hone in on the pitching and they need to figure out a way to keep Carlos Correa, which I'm not sure is possible. I think Correa is going to hit the open market again, but I mean, uh, and again, a letdown of a season in Minnesota. And it, I said in the preseason, I stand by it. It's, it is the pitching. They need to figure have more pitching depth. And the offense definitely was a little bit of a letdown at times. And like I said, Buxton can't really seem to stay healthy for a long period of time, but, they got a ton of stuff to work out over there. The Royals fired their president of ops, uh, one of the brain powers for that 2015 World Series team. Uh, look, this was supposed to be a step forward year for Kansas City, too. Like, people forget, you know, they want to clown on us. That's fine. I, I'm No one's going to clown on the, this season of the Tigers more than myself. This was a, a an objective failure. But let's not forget that the Royals were supposed to take a step in the right direction too. And everybody was super pumped about, you know, Bobby Wood jr. And all these prospects they have coming up and, and they went out and it may have made sneaky under the radar free agent signings over the last couple of years. Like the Royals are still terrible and I'm not really sure where they go from here. They got to, I guess you keep building or do you just say, you know what, let's bottom stay at the bottom for a few more years. Like they are still a ways away. So they're going to be looking for a new, man uh, or woman to run the show as well yeah lot al central man so there you go there's your al central rundown i guess uh, i mean looking at the future i'm not going to be fooled anymore i don't think 
I mean, we'll see what the offseason has to hold. But the last couple of years, I've been like, oh, the AL Central might actually be decent this year. I think it's finally the year. The AL Central is good. And I, I've, you know, had pie on my face by the end of it. I don't think I'm going to be fooled by that again. Like, I, <laughs> we'll see what happens with the White Sox. They have, they're the biggest question mark going forward. Just huge letdown seasons across the board from pretty much everybody. Really poor management. We'll see what happens with LaRusa. Hopefully he's healthy and everything, but. I don't know about his future as the manager for the Chicago White Sox. Uh, yeah, catastrophic failure. One one of, if not the biggest failures of the season is is the 2022 Chicago White Sox. So uh, we'll, we'll see. The AL Central, I mean, going forward, like I said, Cleveland's going to be in play. But Minnesota has a lot of questions to answer. I'm not afraid of, you know, Kansas City in the short term. And the Twins are the Twins until they prove otherwise. So... I don't know. But this year, Cleveland's the way to do it. Cleveland really is the way to do it. A lot of teams should be looking closer at Cleveland and going, that kind of is a really good and well-run organization for as much as they get clowned on for not spending money. Everything else they do outside of opening up the, the pocketbooks, they do really, really well. That's all I got. Thanks for making Lockdown. Tigers, your first listen every single day. Now make your second listen to Locked On MLB Podcast. MLB expert Paul Francis Sullivan brings humor, passion, and his unique perspective on every team and the biggest stories from around the league. Follow the number one daily league-wide podcast, Locked On MLB, on the Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcast. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Week and a half left in this season. Still got some storylines to watch and whatnot. Uh, so, yeah, peace and love going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch you all then, baby. Go Tigers.